I want to talk about basically how um, real exploits or how you can exploit some of the IoT devices out there at the moment. Not much SCADA devices or high-level, high-profile stuff, just consumer stuff, which is, has good ratings on Amazon, which is cheap to buy, and which everybody buys, therefore, and everybody uses. Um, unfortunately, I had a fallout with a few vendors, so um, I had to reduct the 10 devices to uh, seven. <laughs> Because we are one of the good guys, and we are not, we are responsible for disclosing the most stuff or a lot of stuff, and so we said basically we stand back and do not disclose three devices. Um, I picked seven devices which are easy exploitable, which stand out of the crowd, and um, which stand for what is in exploitable in IoT at the moment and which is out there. Not new devices, consumer devices which are used. So I'm Jan and I hack embedded devices, basically. I work for Sekurai, it's a small pen testing company in, based in Munich, and we do a lot of this stuff. So. No further time, I will jump right into one of the first devices. So let's talk about the TP-Link M5350. It's basically a new MTS router with a SIM card in it. And this SIM card makes it kind of accessible for a new attack vector. It's not new, it's, it's an old art. Um, basically, SMS. This device can yeah, you can send SMS to it. And it displays this SMS in one of the web pages. So you can send an XSS vector to it or a pay payload to it. And the fun thing is you, get, you can get uh, your stuff back over SMS. So it doesn't have to be online. It just has to be switched on. Um, it's quite nice. I, I wanted to pop an outlet box um, on the plane, but uh, basically, I broke it with a vector, with a payload, unfortunately. But you can see it's, uh, it's, 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 it's got my URL in there. It, it tries to load something. and But yeah. <laughs> so XSS is quite common. Um, you can find it in every device. Everybody thinks it's not as good, and it's not. But it's, you can use it, and it's. To, uh, for, to exfiltrate data, it's nice. Um, gets, let's get to another one. It's not really a consumer device. Um, it's a retinal scanner. Uh, I don't think anybody has a retinal scanner at home for his front door. Um, I had one for some time. <laughs> it was quite fun. Um, this one has a kind of bugs on the hardware side as well, but I'm, I'm focusing on software. So this one is kind of particular, because um, when you log in, when you try to log in, it posts as to login.cgi, it gets something back, and redirects you to index. Everything done in JavaScript on the client side. So we can just redirect ourselves. Um, there's a little hint in there. Later on, it checks the status, and if the status is not all right, it redirects you back to login. But you can reduct that. Uh, you are in the conversation, so just, just kick it out, and you are in the device as root or as admin. Um, that's kind of bad. I, I disclosed this bug quite some time ago, and after the talk, a guy came up to me and said, um, um, we're using this product productive. And it's not, I don't know if it's going to be fixed. I have no information back. That's the problem about disclosing sometimes. Um, and we'll see. I'm just putting it out there now, again. <laughs> so to the next one. An old, good old camera. 
It's a vstar cam. Um, this one will eventually drop shell, a root shell. So interesting stuff is I uh, reviewed the camera last year approximately. I bought it from Amazon, updated the firmware, and so on. And um, after I got my shell and I got passwords, I tried to yeah crack the passwords. What do you do when you crack the passwords? You take them to Google. And um, it's the fastest way most of the times. So I got to a web page where somebody cracked a similar cam camera where in the comments were the exact password hash I, I, I had. So I was looking at their stuff, and uh, we were trying to bring it together. It was quite fun. Eventually, we came to the conclusion that, yeah, it's the same exploit in the FTP settings. <laughs> it's a basic command injection you find every day. It's not high-level memory corruption stuff. It's just injection. And if you set up your NC right, you get a shell back, uh, or you get the passwords back, and you can log into Telnet. Interesting stuff is the article I mentioned before is from 2014. So this bug is known. And this bug is known because the vStarCam has a new account titled vStarCam 2015. They even changed the password to some kind of um, date later on. So the bug is known. It's kind of fixed, but not in the common sense. So that's one type of command injection. Let's look at another one. I changed the types. I look at a router. Travel router are quite kind of nice because they travel around, and you see them in every network, in hotels and stuff like that. If they are accessible over network or over van port, you can basically drop your payload on it, and it travels to another network. It's quite nice. So I bought this one, and I brought it to a conference with me. I didn't have time to exploit it. At this time, we thought, let's do it together. So um, we hooked it up. Uh, yeah, we hooked it up, and a friend of mine said, oh, it's Talent Open. And yeah, he connected, typed in root, typed in some password, and got a shell. We thought about this. OK, what did he type? Let's recap. OK, Telnet is open. It has a hard-coded root password, which is root. <laughs> and you can't change it. <laughs> so you often find um, hard-coded passwords on IoT devices. Uh, even in password files, you have different passwords which are not known to the user. Um, sometimes they are found, and sometimes they are exploited, and sometimes you can use them even in the web interface. But most of the times, they are just there to yeah, be exploited, like a backdoor. The next one is also a travel router. It's a Hutu travel mate. I, I like this one, personally. I, I take it everywhere with me. Um, because it has a battery in it, it can run standalone. Um, so it's quite nice. Uh, interesting stuff is their firmware update is a bash file, basically. It's secured by a CSC checks checksum, which checks itself. Yeah, so we can basically implement packages on this device, but only as admin. That's, that's not what we want. We want it as guest account or unauthenticated. So let's have a look if we can evaluate, uh, evaluate our privileges to, to admin from guest. Um, there's a method to change, your, uh, to change your password in this device, even as guest. Uh, the call looks like this. If you look at it closely, you see name guest, pvd1 and pvd2. These are the two passwords. You have to enter two because, you know, checking if it's the right password and you didn't mistype. Interesting stuff is they also give them guest. So if I change that to admin, the whole password for admin changes. So I can change the password as guest account for another user, for any user I want. So I can gain admin password, and I can gain admin privileges. So to recap, I can upload a bash script anywhere I want. I'm authenticated. 
from one port. Um, I can elevate credentials and trigger firm firmware update as root. So profit. <laughs> I get a root shell back, which is, which is nice. It's, um, you can upload your own stuff there. It's, it's quite nice. Next one is a trend net, also a travel router. I see that a lot around in, in hotels. Um, it's quite interesting. It's quite interesting to use because when you look at the firmware, you can see a lot of stuff. Interesting stuff is, I highlighted it, the sz command is a sleep kill minus nine with a command injection and something. Yeah, basically it does do OS commands over get parameter. It gets even more interesting. This is doable over one port, unauthenticated. Um, so they're not securing, there are even more vulnerabilities in this device. Uh, they have another RCE on a different layer, and it's, it's all riddled with, with different vulnerabilities. But this one is quite bad, because it, it shows that the architectural design of this device is, is not how it should be. You shouldn't run commands like that uh, over GET or over the web anyway. So they, they, they fixed it. It's, it's still in there, but authenticated. Um, it's, a, it's a start, I say, but OK. Um, I want to get to the last one. The last one is quite interesting. Um, I wanted it to be a big one. Uh, some guys beat me to it. Um, the W My Cloud, WD My Cloud. The exploit he has released a blog post approximately a month ago, or exactly a month ago, with 85 RCEs. <laughs> it, they are really interesting, the RCEs. I picked one of them. Just they're all the same, basically. It's, 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 you don't have to document all of them because it, it's all the same. You, you get some parameters and you shove them into a command which gets opened. So that's riddled. You can, you can get anywhere. So they found 70 authenticated ones, 30 unauthenticated ones. But the thing is, it's a login bypass also. <laughs> so you have to reduct the authenticated to unauthenticated. Um, and then you can say, yeah, arbitrary file write and CSR and password reset. It's, it's all fine. But interesting stuff is, how would you disclose 85 bucks? It's, it's, it's not possible for a small company, because every time I try to disclose a bug, it takes me four to five mails to explain that to vendors. And that's too much time. If, if you sample 85 bucks in one email, not all of them will get fixed, because you see, um, if you, it's always easier to take one ticket and resolve one ticket and not do two things in one ticket. It's just easier to distribute to different teams. Um, what I want to say about all, the, all of this is you're always somebody's noob. Not, the developer are not to blame. They, are, they do what they do, and they have their budget, and they have what they have. They, they know stuff, and they're probably better at stuff, at some things, at you. And so, but sometimes they should ask, and sometimes a researcher should, or an IT sec guy, should sit in a conference talk with team and discuss about architecture of certain devices. It costs money, but yeah, it's better than having 85 bucks in a system. So please, please let researchers help the deaf guys. It's, it's utmost important that, um, that you do Back bounty programs, even if you don't give out bounties, 
it just let them have a way to disclose bugs without writing five emails. It just takes too much time. It, for big companies, they have certain teams which, where you can give your advisories to and they just submit them. But, and they do the hassle for you. But for independent researchers, which are the mass crowd, it's not possible. And most of the guys tend to go to full disclosure because it's too much of a hassle to talk to the vendors. And that's not how it should be. You shouldn't take... It's, it's all, for, for pen testers, it's always fun to search for bugs. Always. <laughs> but they can't be bothered by writing reports. And I think a lot of researchers are annoyed by writing reports. I personally saw, saw a lot of them. And so just take it out of them and let them write their advisories and try to understand them and probably set down somebody to just do advisories and look at them and uh, classify them. They are happy to answer but not in five emails with four different guys. So that's my message to, to you. Thank you. <laughs>